Ah, book by book. Yes, here we are once again in the Lady Chapel of Liverpool Cathedral. I'm Richard Buse, joined here by Paul Blackham, Dr. Paul Blackham, and also by our special visitor, George Voa, who is the founder of Operation Mobilization, which has a worldwide Christian ministry lasting over 50 years. And it's a great joy to have you mm. back in this series of studies with us, uh, George. Great to be here. We're doing the Acts of the Apostles. And what I'm going to do is to take us, first of all, now to chapter 2, because we're on study number 2. Chapter 2, Luke writing, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So something was happening there in Jerusalem on that extraordinarily heady day for the Christian church. The crowds began to gather. People began to listen. Peter got up to preach. And by the end of the day, well, the Christian church in its modern form had come into being in the most extraordinary way. Paul Black, let me just put this to you. What was the significance of the Feast of Pentecost? Uh, uh, why did it happen then? Well, I'm glad, you know, I always love these Old Testament background questions. I've just got to be careful I don't say too much. But Leviticus 23 tells us about this uh, Feast of Pentecost and all those ancient feasts as Joseph Steinberg's taught us when we've done things yes. with Joseph Steinberg, how all those feasts are telling us deep gospel truths about Jesus and his gospel and all the things that he does. And, and this one in particular, what this one was about was it happened at the beginning of the harvest time and it was a way of taking the first fruits of the harvest time and then thanking the Lord for the harvest that you know is going to come. And then there's another festival later in the year when the full harvest is in. So it was a way of saying, Lord, you've given us these great things. We know, here's the first of it. We know there's a lot more to come. And so you can see why it was, this fa it was a, a, fa a festival that was looking forward to this time of a great harvest, not just the harvest of food growing uh -huh. in Israel, but the harvest of like the world, the redemption of the whole creation. And so it, on that very feast, what's so wonderful is the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh at that feast. And it, you can think it's like a first fruit. It's like the first part of this incredible harvest of the redemption of the whole world. And you see it ha beginning the first sample of this glorious new creation future that Lord Jesus is bringing about. It happens on that day. It it's, couldn't have happened on a better feast. And it's, uh, that word Pentecost comes from the Greek word oh, yeah. Pentekonta, which is 50, isn't it? it yes, it is. The Greek, it's, Greek for 50. It's, it's for 50 because it happened 50 days after the feast of Passover. You can read all about it in Leviticus, Leviticus so 23. I always like plugging Leviticus. Well, I love that, <laughs> that thought that you bring out about the first fruits. The first fruits. Because there was yeah. the first fruits being brought and there's the 3,000 people who made their response that day. Of course, there's mystery here, isn't there? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, as Jesus once said, about like the Holy Spirit, he's like the wind who blows wherever it will. And suddenly they hear the sound. It's not an actual wind, but they hear the sound of a mighty mm. wind. There's mystery here. Yeah. I think there's sovereignty here because the Spirit does what He will want in people's lives. Yes. There's energy here, because there is lift-off now <laughs> yeah. for the Christian church in its, modern, in its modern form. So thinking, then comes verse 14, George, the sermon of Peter that catapults the church in its modern form into being. I mean, at the beginning of biblical history, way, way back in Genesis, I mean, all the languages of the world were confused, if we remember, the, the Tower of Babel, and the nations were then driven apart and scattered in a way. How fair is it to say that Pentecost was the sort of reverse of that happening? Well, there's certainly uh, some similarities, and I think it needs to be emphasized that these people uh, suddenly recognized their own language being spoken, though mm. they came from all over the sort of known world mm. of that day. All and, around the Mediterranean Basin, Cappadocians, Parthians, Medes, all that. It's a beautiful picture of the internationalness the, of, of the body of Christ. Here's mm. the very, very beginning. Today, there are people who love Jesus from you know, way over 75% of all the languages in the world. Even some that don't have scriptures, 
have believers because they've come to Christ through oral mm -hmm. a message or through the Jesus film. So this is, to me, a beautiful picture of people of many different uh, languages. they mainly all Jews or proselytes at this point. Acts 11 yes. will totally change sure. that. Mm -hmm. But it's still a phenomenal uh, challenge to realize what God was doing here. I might just say that in my counseling ministry over the years, I find sometimes people trying to reproduce Pentecost. But I think this is a historic event. Mm -hmm. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can experience the anointing of the Spirit. But I believe the Holy Spirit came at this time. And since this time, every believer, I believe, is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Because it says if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you don't have Christ. It's a saving event. Yeah. But... Yeah. There can be many fillings of the Spirit. There can be different anointings of the Spirit. And it's sad that there's so much controversy yeah, about the Holy Spirit. I think of Billy Graham, my spiritual father, and speaking about the Spirit-filled life and some of the controversy. Is it filling? Is it baptism? Does this happen? Does that happen? Billy Graham said, I don't care how you get it. Just get it. Yeah. Speaking of the reality, the book of Acts reality which is what we're wanting to impart I, yeah. in this study. I love Billy Graham's book, The Holy Spirit. It says so much that's very helpful and uniting as well. Yes, it's a unique event. It's a universal event, as you're hinting at, an evangelistic event. So you could no more have another Pentecost than you could have another crucifixion, really. Mm. It's all li linked together in the great saving actions of God in Jesus Christ. But I'm looking now again, Paul Blackham, Expert on the Old Testament. <laughs> I mean, here in verse, what is it, 16? Yeah. Uh, Peter's referring back to the ancient prophecies of uh, Joel mm. and verse 16 following. And then David as well from the Psalm 16, from verse 25 onwards. Why does Peter do that? Well, again, we'll be able to go into it in more detail in the study guide. But... Um, this okay, everybody, have a look at this. Yeah, yeah. There's the, there's you know, the study guide. We, we, we have produce study, study guides. And uh, so although we have this, uh, all it's a lovely program, which we're sharing it together, there's also a study program which we can get with it and uh, use in house groups or wherever. It's very, very useful. Anyway, Paul, and, and it enables me, because there's a lot in these prophecies, these ancient prophecies, and we'll see that coming up time and time again through the book of Acts. And it's this, this event about the Holy Spirit being poured out, not just on the Jewish people in the nation of Israel, but, to be, but for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on all flesh, all people, regardless of their nationality or cultural background or language. Mm. It's this phenomenal event that was prophesied that one day this would happen. And, and he refers back to this particular prophecy in, from Joel where that happens. And he says, everyone who call, ending with that, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone, regardless of their cultural, national, genetic background, whatever. And then it, again, to drive forward this thing that what is happening among them is, not is, is, is a, an event that had been prophesied by the ancient scriptures. So he goes back and speaks about David. David was looking forward to these very events that were happening. David looked forward to the crucifixion of Jesus, and we can think of Psalm 22. And then here with Psalm 16, when David was looking forward to the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and it's remarkable he applies that to the resurrection of Jesus he does. Christ. He's a, like, yeah. David was a prophet. He looked ahead and saw that these things were going to happen. So he's really, Peter's addressing this, this, all these people who come from around the, this part of the world to come to Jerusalem they were all people who loved the scriptures and he's saying what is happening is what is spoken about by the ancient scriptures you're being you know you're caught up in the moment now with some of the most incredible events of world history that were spoken about in in thousands of years ago it's it's wonderful in the last days god says i will pour out my spirit on all people you get this all the way through luke's writings in the, in the first one in the gospel He's so concerned that the whole world shall know about Jesus. Yes. Now here he is again, the universality yeah. of this wonderful thing that was happening. Amazing. And then we, of course, as Peter goes on preaching, the people are listening like mad. And in fact, they're convicted because it says there in verse 37, when the people heard all this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And they must have been trembling, some of them shaking, uh, what should we learn from Peter's answer, George? Well, let's just read the answer because it's, it's so powerful in itself. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness 
of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's very clear in the book of Acts, and we see it here, that people are called to repent, to turn from their sin and believe on the Lord Jesus. That is the way of salvation. That's the gospel message I heard. I came from a nominal Christian background. Uh, my one grandfather was an atheist. My other grandfather was Scottish, Irish, and English, which is basically toxic. He was a <laughs> drunk. And uh, I went to this Billy Graham meeting. My heart had been prepared through a Gospel of John. 1957? 55. Five. Two years later was the crusade. By then I was already hiring buses, bringing <laughs> my friends in. But this one night stand with Billy Graham, I heard this same message that Peter is preaching here salvation in Jesus alone. And there may be someone studying with us somewhere in the world and you don't actually know Jesus. You've never really repented and believe on Jesus. And that would be the greatest joy to know that someone through this series came to faith in Christ. Uh, well, if we want that to apply to everybody who's sharing in this study with us right now, and of course, you, it's wonderful. You've got the two events, the cross and the resurrection, all mentioned here in this chapter. You've got the two promises of the gift of the Spirit and forgiveness of sins. You've got the two responses that have to be made, repent and believe. And so that it's highly evangelistic. It speaks to our, our very hearts. Mm. It's wonderful that you had that experience all those years ago. 1955. My goodness me. Oh, George. God's grace. Uh, I'm looking on at verse 44. It says here then, after this wonderful event, 3,000 people responding, at least. And then all the believers, verse 44, were together. And he goes on to describe what that life was like. Actually, didn't Karl Marx get hold of all of this? And mm. he, on the basis of what he read here, he then sort of more or less invented communism. What, what do we make of that? Well, I mean, that's the thing. When you read this, and lots of people can read that. And he was and missing something. He was missing something. So he <laughs> looks at it, and it's fantastic the way that people will look at that and think, that's what we should do. We need to be in a world where everyone shares everything and, and looks after one another. This is the kind of life that would solve the world's problems. And then he came up with this system. But he thought, oh, that Jesus stuff, the God stuff, I'll strip that out. That's just an irrelevance. Let's just get at people sharing. Well, you can't do that because the human heart is, is greedy and selfish and people... What you need is a revolution that begins in the human heart, a change of mind, a change of heart, setting people free to live the life of the living God. That's the engine that's in behind all this. Oh. When people are set free by Jesus, then they're saying, okay, now I'm going to serve other people and care for other people and share what I have with them. You take Jesus out of the picture, it doesn't work anymore. And you have to have armies and governments to force people to do it rather than it welling up from a changed heart. The life of the spirit in people, that's what's the real uh, socialist revolution, if you will. Yeah. And I think the key when we study scriptures is to not just take one verse, but to look yeah. at the whole passage, to look at the whole book, then to look at the whole Bible. That's what we're doing slowly over the years, right? Yeah. But I think people should study carefully. I have probably a hundred times, verse 42, right through to the end of chapter two, because there you have a whole balanced presentation of, of the Christian life. The apostles teaching, fellowship, the worship aspect, the breaking of bread, and then, of course, the miracles and the ministry uh, by the apostles. And then you have the selling of possessions. But notice also verse 46, every day they continued together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We cannot separate the living of the Christian life community is just one aspect of it, from seeing people saved. And this is the tragedy today. There's so many churches, they're enjoying nice fellowship together and they have their weddings, they have their funerals, they have their little potluck suppers, but they're not seeing people saved. They, they can't claim that they are following biblical truth. They're only following part of it. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the greatest burdens on my heart. It must be surely the thing that many of us have got to share that burden with you, George. Yeah, I mean, we, this is an amazing and wonderful chapter. It should galvanize us. Is the, his, the prophetic element in it? 
with which, what Paul was referring to. There's the historic element because he's pointing to the, what has actually happened in the gospel, in the sermon. There's the messianic element because he's, the person who you crucified is Lord and Christ, he's saying. And there's also then this apostolic element. What is, makes an apostolic church? Why, it's those who follow the apostolic teaching and those who are certainly are practicing what you are saying, adding to the number daily, those who are being saved. The Lord does that. It may be that as we close off this study, he's saying that to you. He's saying, come in on this thing. Come in on this thing that began nearly 2,000 years ago and be part of a movement that is touching, well, what is it touching? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. We're part of that, and you must be too. We'll meet again for another study before too long.